Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Mark, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Could you please introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Sure, and thanks for having me. So I'm Mark Aronson. I'm an associate professor at Rutgers University uh, in the School of Communication and Information. Uh, My doctorate's in American history. um, And I try to write books where I kind of do original research and read what the academics and experts have to say and then make that information more available to a broad audience from high school adult up just try to digest what everyone has done in deep research and make it more uh, accessible so so we can all have that information uh to share that's an important thing you write kids books too i saw you have some kids books on there i do write as young as uh, children's books and there too i'll go with an expert to an archaeological site at Stonehenge or in South Africa and um, sort of see what they're discovering, uh, new, new insights, and then find ways to to tell those stories to young people. I always feel like, why should you not get the new news, new discoveries until you're in college or an adult? Why shouldn't a young person be able to learn just like every day I check what the James Webb telescope is showing us about the universe. Like there's such amazing new information around us. And I do feel like we should all have access to it. I know the recent discovery of dark matter is relatively, I mean, it's not super new, but it's relatively new from the people I've talked to. And um, that's something I didn't find out until I was in my, you know, a month ago um so much and also you know there's so many this is tangential but there are so many new discoveries now about human evolution dna is telling us things we never knew not only about how we evolved but on the movements of peoples where people have moved throughout time um we're just really relearning our past with new tools um but so, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, I... Um, <laughs> well, let's talk about a, Master of Deceit real quick, because that's that that's where I found you. I wrote a book called Master of Deceit, J. Edgar Hoover and America in the Age of Lies. Now, the title is taken from a book he wrote, or that was ghostwritten for him, called Masters of Deceit, in which he that was his critique of, of, commun- of what he thought of communists. And then I use the same title to talk about him. Uh, and But when I was young, I, Hoover was a hero of mine. And I remember going to the FBI uh, museum in Washington and being thrilled to see, you know, the stories of Dillinger and the gangster era and everything like that. Uh, but then later, of course, there was uh, what we learned about Hoover after he died and and the later investigations and some really brilliant uh, scholarship. So I was sort of trying to reconcile those images, but really understand the man and uh, understand what made him tick, what why he acted as he as he did, and also to engage with, you know, there are so many rumors uh, around Hoover that I thought I should really look deeply at what the best scholars say so that we're not kind of caught up in 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 fanciful ideas. So that's what I tried to do in my book. Um, and be happy to tell you what yeah. I've learned. What, 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 can you take me into the, I guess, the beginning of his life? Like I'm trying to understand the man because he is someone that, like I said to you off air, I've come across his name multiple times involved in the Kennedy topic, which is very close to my heart. Um, and it's not painted a pretty good picture about him at all, but there's just one thing I could never understand was how did this guy get this hatred for communism so bad? Like he was on a never ending hunt for it and he did it. And 
I like I would have to preface this. I have talked to both sides of it. So like when people talk about Alan Dulles, which is a name that gets brought up, I've talked to someone who's personally kind of did a biography on him. Stephen Kinzer's wrote about MK Ultra, and Alan Dulles is involved in that. But he talked about it just weren't seeing it like how you know uh, we see it as oh my god that's horrible. It's more like I have to do what the country needs because no one else is going to do it. And it brings in this other perspective of like, if that's how you're viewing it, then obviously it might seem extreme to some people, but to you it's justified because the threat of communism back then was painted in such a sense where it was like, you could die tomorrow. And it's trying now to understand those times is like, what was propaganda from both sides to really show how much of either if it was inflated or if it was brought out there for a point. And that's where I found your book. Sure. Well, so let me give two sides to this. So Hoover grew up with an extremely determined mother who um, this was at a time, you know, coming out of the 19th century where women had not many options and often women who today would be, you know, the heads of companies or sitting on boards or, you know, sitting in Congress sort of had to live through their sons. Um, so they would sort of pour all of their ambition into, into a male child. And this was exacerbated by the fact that Hoover's father was a, a sort of unassuming weak man who ultimately lost his job. And so Hoover grew up with this sort of forceful woman who actually lived with him until she died and he was in his mid forties. Um, and this sort of disappointment of a father. And so I think he was a person who was absolutely driven towards this idea of success and achievement and clarity, and in particular, purity, um, wanting uh, himself to be pure and wanting the country to be pure. He also grew up in a segregated Washington. And so some aspect of purity was a kind of white world that he knew. Um, and so I then this is going to link, you know, the question has often been brought up as to whether he was closeted gay or whether he I don't buy it. dressed up in women's clothes or everything like that. And my sense of him is not that any of that was true but rather that he repressed his own feelings, that it's not that he was hiding actions from the world, he was hiding himself from himself. So that sense of needing to be absolutely on guard against impurity, against evil, against something that would destroy a good world was the sort of the, the driving force of his life. Uh, one was to succeed, and, and, and be successful, but the other was this sort of idea of absolute purity. And I think that um, that inner drive caused him uh, to, in a way, create this role for himself in government, uh, which would be protecting the purity of the nation. It was the sort of the same drive now expanded he began actually working in the Library of Congress, and in some ways he was a brilliant librarian. In a ways he invented what we would now call a database. That is to say, and this is long before the advent of computers, he would create file systems that cross-hatch different kinds of information about people where they lived, what magazine they subscribed to, what clubs they belonged to. And it was sort of trying to think of when these intersect, do you have the portrait of someone who's suspect? And that was really quite um, clever of him. The danger, of course, was how do you decide what's suspect? Who gets to interpret what these nodes mean? Now, it is... Let's look at communism. There are really two different meanings we have to consider here. Communism as an economic and political theory, going back to Marx and Engels, is legal. You are perfectly, it is perfectly fine for you to believe in these ideas, to promulgate these ideas, to 
interpret history or the present through that lens, just as you can as a believer in any other way of seeing the world, whether religious or political or intellectual. However, once you had the existence of the Soviet Union after 1917 and into the 20th century, there was also a power in the world that was interested in exporting revolution. And it was interested in undermining capitalist powers that it saw as enemies, bringing them down and causing what they thought of as this inevitable revolution of the people in other countries. Mostly those plans failed. They failed where they expected them to work, such as in Germany and in France and in England, and they failed here. But so here now you have two, two sides of communism. One, a belief system, in some ways a brilliant belief system that you are legally allowed to think, promulgate, utilize, and the actions of a state seeking to undermine another state, just as the Nazis did, or any state might have plans to, to weaken its adversaries. And that's illegal. The problem was that Hoover did not really make that distinction, a distinction between something that's perfectly fine to, to think and advocate and acting as an agent of a foreign power. And that is where, when you talk about the violations from COINTELPRO, the McCarthy era, et cetera, the Red Scare back to 1919, 1920, in his drive for purity, in his drive to make America as walled off as he did in his own life, he was perfectly ready to trample on rights, to, 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 to make his own authority matter more than legality, than understanding. Um, and so there's where the problem came, where his own drive, now, here, here's the complexity. His drive for purity did in some ways fit almost perfectly with the job of a person who is to protect the nation against threats, right? That's kind of the mindset of someone who's going to be very alert to threats. So in that sense, he was suited to his job. The problem is he acted without a, without he wanted to and succeeded in creating a way in which he could act without supervision he couldn't disseminate kind of the line that you would have to draw on what you would be do that would be ethical or maybe less severe right he he created a system that protected him from um being observed so for example when the FBI engaged in illegal surveillance, uh, wiretaps or uh, bugs that were not approved, he, re he recorded that, but he recorded it in a file called Do Not File. So if a congressional investigator said, give me all your files relating to surveillance, he could honestly say, I don't have any because they were in a file that wasn't a file. That damn plausible deniability. Yes, and he he was brilliant at that. There were three levels of hidden files that he maintained. And that was in order to give him the autonomy to make his own judgment. The other thing he did that was again brilliant is people in Washington from FDR, who was the original person who gave him the authority to go after subversion, broadly defined or undefined, wanted information that he had. So, and they knew he had. And anytime a politician 
got illegal information from Hoover, which meant the politician was grateful to Hoover, but it also meant that Hoover now had something on the politician because the politician was using illegal information. So it was this web that he continually kept building where he kept gathering information about even the people who were using his information. And that made him extremely hard to dislodge, which gets to the Kennedys. So when- oh, I got um, a quick question. My my viewpoint on Hoover after, what, there's the talks of blackmail, obviously, but I feel like that's that's just going to happen no matter who the person is because you're opened up to a wealth of information that you should not know. And now you have – everything is always do a favor for somebody even in the world today, and a lot of that can be used. I feel like eventually you just kind of lean there. Now, I'm not apologizing or saying anything for the actions of blackmailing, but I feel like that's just going to be any single person that's put in a position like that. And then also you mentioned before about working at the library. Did he have OCD? Is that why he's such an extremist on so many I don't. Things? I mean he was never diagnosed, but I would say – it's not far from, he was extremely detail oriented. But what I would say, if he did, or if that would be part of how you define him, it was well married to his job. So rather than it undermining his, his efficiency, it, it, it fed his efficiency. Um, but I wouldn't say it was just OCD because there was a clarity. I mean, he really did understand how to gather information uh, and, and meaningful information. Um, but to what you're saying, what you're saying is two thirds true. It's true that anyone who has information is in a position to utilize it. Um, the difference is that in, from the 40s through the end of Hoover's era, there was a lot of secrecy in Washington that is less so now. In other words, for example, reporters knew about many politicians' affairs. They wouldn't necessarily reveal those. A, some of them were having their own affairs. B, it gave them access to the politician, especially there were male reporters and male politicians. It was sort of an old boys network. So there was a world of secrets that were available to be mined in a way that is less so now. There are so many outlets for information that mean there's, there's, there's not as much of a buildup of a world that's unspoken. Um, so I, I, and then the second side of it is post Hoover and when there was the church commission investigations, greater oversight was established over the FBI. And while there have been post 9-11, there were pressures against that. And certainly we had the issues around torture and things like that. Um, not the FBI, but the government. CIA, um, Phoenix program. Yeah, CIA uh, and rendition. Um, so there was a swing again, but I think oversight does diminish the capacity for that kind of blackmail. It doesn't eliminate it, but it's different when you do or don't have oversight. And Hoover set things up such that he did not have oversight or that it was very easy to evade. Um, and that's why it got so out of hand because he controlled the 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 action and that so just to, to to mention about the Kennedys you know John Kennedy was a womanizer of, of to an extreme and even sick degree so was John and um and Hoover knew it and Hoover had the evidence and so John Kennedy was involved with Judith Exner who was involved with the mafia at the same time he was involved with a woman who was close to the Nazis he was involved with a woman who had been a communist spy and so when Robert Kennedy wanted to get rid of Hoover which was the time because it was a new era in the country he couldn't 
because Hoover made clear that he had this, this information about John Kennedy. And that was a case of direct and successful blackmail. But it was also made possible by John Kennedy's actions and by, by a Washington in which that kind of behavior was not unusual. So it it's a portrait of Hoover, but it's also a portrait of his time, a portrait of a time in which there was, you know, politicians did have these kinds of affairs that were known and not discussed. That's why I'm trying to understand the times a lot better by trying to at least dive into it and look at both perspectives of it. Because, I mean, when you're working the system with the time that you have, it looks bad now, but back then, that's just how things were. I mean, the number of scandals that were on Lyndon Johnson that dropped off when he became president is why people think he had something to do with the – I don't believe that. There's a bunch of conspiracies I don't believe about Hoover. I don't believe the fact that the mob, the mob had him in a dress, um, which gets mentioned. What I do think is more true is the fact that – he didn't go after the mob because he believed it was a state situation where the state police should go after them. From what I've read, um, his FBI was more. I, I Sorry to interrupt you. I think it's the, that and something else. I, I agree with you. I don't think it had to do with the mob having him. It, a photo it of him came from Anthony Summers like book. Yeah. Anthony Summers book is, is not. It's it's it, it's tre treat it as don't treat it as a book even it's it's it, it's just I don't know a Halloween decoration but um, what I would say is that Hoover back to this idea of purity first of all who was in the FBI were basically Protestants uh, you know white Protestant men. And this created a problem from the FBI in trying to infiltrate the mafia, who were Italian and Catholic. So he did not, it later, he later gained more Catholic and Mormon agents. But at that at the time when it became clear that the mafia existed, he just didn't have agents who could easily uh, fit in that world. Second of all, he was very reluctant to have his men get involved in something where they could be tainted, where they would be subject to being blackmailed themselves, turned through drugs or women or gambling or in some way. He kind of felt like the mafia was something, and also in a certain way, it policed itself. It was its own world. And in a way, he, he, that was not the world he wanted to engage in. Uh, it's the same like with civil rights. You know, the FBI did not want to try to protect civil rights workers in the South when the local police were white segregationists because they worked with the local police. And so he did not want to put his men in a position where they were at odds with the local authority. He also was not... He did. He was not perfect personally in favor of the civil rights and anti segregation actions, but it was also again he didn't want his men to to be tainted by or engage with something as you say on the state level and something that was sort of not their territory. It was almost like stay away, stay away. Um, I I don't think this was a matter of him. Um, being blackmailed by the mob i think it was more like leaving the mob to itself well it got into it got into a weird point where they started working together not only the fbi but the cia was and the way i kind of view this is castro the way that he was projected into society as well at that point and i haven't looked into castro's life to determine a bunch of things that obviously there's probably some of that that's got to be true as well too about how bad of a person he was but Hoover worked with the FBI, um, with the mob, and so did the CIA to try and assassinate him. And that offered organized crime in a sense to where mafia members were 
working under the FBI. And it was so the FBI didn't have roots traced back to them. It's a smart, very, very smart thing that they did. But it's just like that's new for a lot of people to understand this relationship. And I I think of this guy as like a perfectionist in a sense that wants this pure angle. I go, that's got to be the darkest thing for you to do morally to yourself because you know how much you've rooted out this hate. And I think he probably would have turned on the mob at some point and bit him in the ass or something like that if he found the perfect opportunity. But I, that's just a weird relationship that developed out of a man that I've had never seen anything or wouldn't even think in a million years would even head that direction. Well, you know, the Castro case is complicated because, you know, the um, exploding seashells, that's nuts. That's nuts. <laughs> there was the fear of the spread of communism into Latin, the Caribbean and Latin America via Cuba. Castro was a you know, he was a compelling leader, as was Che Guevara, uh, and there were the Cuba was poorly governed, and there was certainly opportunity for a charismatic leader to uh, overturn a corrupt and unpopular government. So again, the conditions of the time made Castro possible. I think once he was in power, he was quite dictatorial, and um, you know, though he could tell a good story um, and was appealing to some as this kind of hero of, of the far left, you know, his, his rule was quite damaging to Cuba. Um, I think the effort, the American efforts to get rid of him, both the assassination efforts and the Bay of Pigs, were just very poorly done. And in many respects, just reflected how little not just Hoover, but America per se, understood movements on the ground. This is the same mistakes in Vietnam. America did not understand the yearnings and points of view on the ground, and so tended to ally with elite structures who might be English speaking or you know, friendly to American business, and not really see the world from the standpoint of the people within those places, and therefore may just just stumbled, made made bad mistakes and mad bad judgment calls. As to Hoover and the mob, the other thing again is the tool that the FBI had and that ultimately was successful were wiretaps, were they surveillance gathering information where they could learn about the interconnections. But then again, that gave Hoover more power because it was those same wiretaps that turned up the Judith Exner uh, relationship uh, with John Kennedy. So he would use the tools that he was comfortable with and thought would be successful, but those tools gave him more power. With all these, I mean, Kennedy at one point was going to have J. Edgar Hoover retire. And if you look at the FBI and their relationship with J. Edgar Hoover, that was that was their hero, basically, in a sense. Everything went through Hoover. Um, it became a problem later when Nixon was trying to coerce Hoover into helping him out and apply pressure on a certain situation. And Hoover wouldn't do it because, I mean, Hoover was involved in a lot of stuff. I don't think he could spread himself thin in that aspect. But he knew that if Hoover wouldn't follow, then his FBI wouldn't follow. And um, well, I mean, Nixon knew this um, if he couldn't get Hoover on board. So Nixon created his own FBI. But I'm curious when Hoover's going to retire or being forced into retirement from John Kennedy. Did you look at what happened around then and see what if you could find any resentment or just documentation of just anger when it came to that? You mean Hoover towards the Kennedys? Hoover hated the Kennedys. I mean, he hated Robert. Ken if you remember, Robert Kennedy's career began as an aide to Joe McCarthy. And, um, you know, Hoover saw him as this young, I think he called him a whippersnapper, you know, using his daddy's money and power, which was pretty much true. Um, you know, Robert Kennedy was the runt of the litter of the Kennedys. And, you know, he was meant to be a priest, um, but was sort of thrust into a different role. You know, his eldest brother, Joseph, who was a war hero, uh, died in uh, World War II, and he was the one who was meant to be the president. And um, John, when John was lifted into that spot, 
uh, Robert uh, was shifted into being becoming sort of uh, John's consigliere, his advisor. Um, but he was a tough, brawling kind of guy, um, Bobby Kennedy, and and Hoover really didn't like him. Um, and they were outsiders sort of changing the Washington world that, that Hoover knew how to, to swim in. They did, though reluctantly, um, the Kennedys did more on civil rights than, than Hoover would have liked. Um, and so it was a new era, a new age, one he wasn't as comfortable with, and he, he didn't like them. But he was smart. He knew how to play to power. He knew how to 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 make himself indispensable. So there, and I would say in the FBI there were mixed feelings. He was the boss, and everything went through him. But people, there were people in the FBI who also resented him, feared him, were dubious about him. It was his creation, and everyone knew as long as he was there, you couldn't run afoul of him. You had to practice how you would shake his hand because he judged you by having this kind of manly, non-sweating handshake that showed you were a good guy. Um, so the, he he ran a tight ship, but there were countercurrents and cross currents within the FBI uh, about him and about the legality of the actions he undertook. Um, you know, uh, especially in the in the COINTELPRO era, where he was illegally undermining free speech, and he was yeah, he created and the Radical Observer. He was he was trying to he was successfully infiltrating organizations and driving them towards extremity. He was doing, by the way, exactly what Putin did. In America in 2016, and again, we've learned recently uh, when there were women's marches in Washington protesting uh, in the Trump era, Putin did the same thing. He would have his agents enter uh, feminist groups and have tr attempt to turn them ever more radical so that they would clash with other feminist groups and undermine the, the cooperative effort. So the it's the same play. Uh, it, it, it and and the, the Soviet and that's one thing to say. I mean, the Soviets were horrible. I mean, Stalin was a, a, a mass murderer on a colossal scale, and of his own people, or of the Poles, of the Jews, um, he he was a really you know absolutely comparable to Hitler, and so it is. We need to recognize that we were dealing with a, 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 you know, very forceful, determined, and unscrupulous enemy. The problem is that doesn't mean we get to be exactly the same. Yeah. Uh, I think it's difficult because, like I said, I'm looking through Hoover. I didn't just look through Kennedy's administration of him. I looked through Johnson administration of him. I listened to tapes of him talking about the assassination. He was one person I, I mentioned when it comes to Lee Harvey Oswald. You mentioned that Lee Harvey wasn't in Mexico City, that it was an impersonation of that. And that comes from Hoover. And that's the guy who made a memo, not even six hours or four hours. I think it's not even almost a, like half a day later about we got the killer of the president, which is weird because an investigation would take time. His interrogation wasn't even close to over yet, but it was like these things where I was like, okay, he's not the person that I just saw him a month ago writing a letter back to this or writing to this. Then you hear him in Johnson and administration speaking about the assassination does not sound like a powerful figure at all. Sounds much more like he's answering questions rather than asking questions. And then you see him towards more of the Nixon administration as well, too. The issue started to become for where I would draw the line would be the radical observer, the influence on college campuses. And that's not just Hoover. That's the CIA as well, too. That's a bunch of other areas, separate issue, sure. But there's a bunch of this. And then the invasion of the Black Panther Party, where I start going, the way he's viewing it, 
is like any radicalization, you got to make it. And that's where he turns up the notch a little bit and they end up fighting amongst each other, which I mean, it's a good strategy if you're looking from his position, but it just, it was a, a messy event in general, which is why I say, I got to try and understand the both perspectives. Most people would say he needs to burn for that, but I'm looking at it. I'm like, as an FBI director, he's doing his job, what he's supposed to be he doing. He is and he isn't. He, 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 he's doing what he defines as his job. But I just want to go back to one about the Lee Harvey Oswald, uh, an area that I'm not an expert on. But my impression is primarily that Hoover's concern was that the FBI not be blamed. In other words, his primary concern is that he not be seen as responsible for not having protected the president. I don't think it's so much that he was involved in some kind of conspiracy or that there were conspiracies he knew of that he didn't reveal. I think it's more that after the fact, he didn't want the FBI to be subject to blame. And I think that was his overriding concern, that his what he was responsible for always seem should always come off best and should never be seen as having failed in some way or being limited in some way or being subject to oversight. Just Reese, just because I've been in the Kennedy assassination for a couple months now, and I've looked through so much documentation on it. I don't think Hoover was a part of the plot like some people do. I know they think Johnson was involved as well, too. I don't think that. I will put my hat in the fact that he might have been involved in the cover up um, only because they didn't they couldn't pin him on the murder of Lee Harvey Oswald of the assassination of President Kennedy. It was only on the officer Tippett, which is like this red herring that gets brought up that was also killed, I think, almost 30 minutes later after Kennedy was shot. But there's so many articles with his mention. There's articles of you know him writing back and forth to people that talk about we can't let there be an idea of conspiracy. And I think if you look at the reason why there's this cover up aspect is because people are going to assume that it was Cubans or it was Russians. And that means you need to go to war and you're going to be held to that responsibility of getting revenge or justifying, you know, trying to rationalize or be able to fix, not fix, but be able to the president was just killed. You got to do something about it. And I think that's where you see a lot of notes of him as well, too. I mean, there's a lot of stuff with witnesses and altered statements as well, too, that has Hoover's signature on it, like it was the go ahead. But I think it's because of that communist aspect, because the ball on communism was ramped up very, very high to an extreme where people were already on edge about communism. And it was, you see that with the Black Panther Party, you see that with a bunch of things that were getting labeled communists that necessarily might have been wrongly justified. I, I think on the Black Panther Party, it's a little bit different. Um, I think that it has, back to what I was saying at the beginning about Hoover and purity, Hoover was obsessed with the idea that a Black leader might arise, a Black prophet who would uh, lead Black people towards some kind of revolutionary sentiment. And you can ask, why did he think that? Why did he feel so um, threatened by the idea of a leader, a leader within the Black community? And I, I do think that goes back to his segregationist childhood and upbringing and where he really could not envision a, a mixed world and a world of equality. And I think that he kept almost projecting that Black people's anger and, and frustration would erupt through this, this sort of misguided Black prophet that would lead them into revolution. And uh, I think that showed his inability to understand or be in sympathy with or an understanding of the legitimate grievances and rights um, and activities of, of African Americans. There is a, it's not even a theory, there's a rumor that his family were passing, that there was an element of African-American heritage. Here's my problem with that. The rumor itself is- I've never even heard it. Yeah, very, very sketchy and not something necessarily to be taken seriously. It is true 
if you look at a lot of photos of Hoover, especially when he was somewhat younger, it's he can look mixed. He can look sort of Hispanic. Um, and it, depending on where the photo was taken, indoors or outdoors, he can be really pretty dark skinned. So whether there was any reality to this rumor or whether it was an anxiety of Hoover's as to how he might be seen, um, I do think he had a kind of personal, the issue around African-Americans was in some way personal to him. And the need to, to repress something that he viewed as explosive and threatening um, I think is true. I think when I said the Black Panther Party, I think a better example, which would have been just the Vietnam War activists, um, things getting labeled with the communist brush that necessarily could have just been peaceful protests. Of, and that's where, uh, again, and I do put my hat in this, which is that why did we go to Vietnam? Why was there a war there? Um, you know, I think when you look at the FBI and the CIA, CIA's charter says they're never supposed to activate on domestic land. And that's, we know that's been happening. So they obviously are not following what that charter is. And I think that's with this idea of Hoover does get mentioned in this, which is the world police and our involvements in uh, Latin America and a bunch of other situations too, where it's like, there wasn't necessarily like there was a war on the home front domestically when it became around the seventies, around Nixon's time, there was a lot of that going on, weather underground and a bunch of other things that were happening. But for the longest time before that, it was happening overseas. And I think that's where you have people with the activism for the Vietnam war. Like, why are we over there? And that's where theories do come out of that as well, too. I, don't, I can't justify going to war. I don't, there's many reasons to go to war, but I think you just start looking at what was going on and eventually that kind of anti-communist thing started getting really brought over here very, very hard. I mean, profiles on people in Hollywood, the guy who made the Yankee doodle dandy had his own little profile um, from Hoover and he was told, told Warner brothers, Hey, like this guy, you know, he has communist ideas or ideologies and we see him sympathizing with people from, com and he made the Yankee doodle dandy, which I guess they, you know, backed off a little bit as well too, but that communist brush was so powerful. It's just hard to understand that when we don't really have that. Type well, of uh, I, I, let me give an answer to that a little bit. So back to when I said there are two kinds of two ways to talk about communism. So in after 1929, in the era of the Great Depression, the American economy was shattered. Uh, many, many people were out of work and suffering, especially African Americans. Um, and it people, there were people who were honestly looking to understand why did this happen? What was the reason for the failure of our economy and causing such horrible devastation in people's lives? And in some ways, especially men who were accustomed to thinking they should be providing for their families and providing for their children, you know, f you know, having no work and no money and sort of abandoning their homes. And so for some, communism seemed to offer an answer, another way of living, a way of living that seemed more humane, to provide for all, to not have these big splits of rich and poor, but rather providing more for everyone. So it was communism as an ideal did appeal to people in the 30s, uh, especially amidst the kind of ruins of, of, of capitalist economies. Um, however, what you also got at that time, as often happens, as happens now, is people became shrill and sort of insisting that you must view the world through this kind of communist lens, that that was the right way to be. And so you had other people who were saying, well, I don't know, I don't necessarily agree with you. So there were these tensions within American thinking in the face of economic collapse. And then, as it became clearer and clearer that Stalin was a mass murderer, more and more people who had thought, well, maybe communism is the answer, 
felt a kind of revulsion, like what what have I swallowed? This this is you know the, the Soviet Union is involved in in the worst crimes, and the reason I'm mentioning this is these swings back and forth between trying to look for a new answer, to having this ideological severity, and then a kind of revulsion for it, did lead to people by the post-war era, post-World War II, sort of turning on each other and saying, hey, you told me I had to be a communist. I didn't want to be a communist. So it was there was a kind of turning back in, in that period um, that that reflected tensions that had been here uh, before then. What are your thoughts on propaganda? I've kind of tried to come at this with more of a balanced approach. Like I get there's light propaganda. Um, light propaganda would be like Hoover and the FBI's uh, personal on screen. You know, the FBI agent could shoot as much as they want, but the enemies, they can only fire a couple of times and they have to miss. And it would make sense why... Hollywood kind of sticks with that template because every movie I see, wherever the FBI comes on screen, I think, oh, my God, something's about to happen. It's about to get real. But then there's kind of I mean, there's a, even another pop like that's light touch, I would say propaganda. Then there's more extreme versions where there was like files on not only Frank Sinatra, but other just actors that just had communist views and checking their mail and a bunch of stuff like that. And then what I would say, like this said, the balanced approach, the benefit if you look at World War II, and I've talked to someone about the myth of the German uh, soldier he wrote a book about, and um, it was this propaganda that these German soldiers would go to like Russia or go to another country, and they would build churches and look good in front of the eyes of people. But they couldn't do that over here, not only because they just couldn't reach over here, but the Americans were fled with so many posters saying, do not trust the deception of a German soldier. If they offer you grace, no, it's not true grace. And it just had me thinking like, so there's the good side of propaganda, I guess, that we weren't as easily fooled by this cloak and dagger mask of a German soldier, um, the Nazis, and obviously, but I think it shows a different side. And I start having these questions about propaganda, like I've seen more dangers domestically on propaganda, of divisivizing people in such a way. But I've also seen ways that in a war effort, it has severely helped not only in a morale standpoint, but also in a misrepresentation of maybe these German soldiers aren't that bad. And then that goes down a darker route. Well, I think propaganda is just a fact. In other words, every side is always going. I mean, you know, we're about to have an election. The airwaves are flooded with ads. For, I'm politically homeless. I'm staying out of it. Uh, no, I, I'm just saying we're flooded with ads from both sides. And uh, I think everybody will engage in propaganda the question is, I think, for us, less to condemn propaganda per se and to be skeptical consumers. To, In other words, what's someone trying to convince me of and why? And I think, especially now, when propaganda comes not just through posters or campaigns or t TV, but through social media, we really, the, the the onus is on us to become skeptical consumers, to become, to pe as you're doing, ask questions about who's, who's selling me what and why. Yeah, but what I do is not popular at all. This is like, well, not popular as not like views, but this is not the choice to take whenever you go and do anything in your life when you want to make a decision. There's not a lot of people that want to talk to both sides and get, I don't know why, but that's just not people hear one side i think and it's agree. a skill we have to develop uh the ability to listen carefully and think critically about everything uh, because we're uh, what i say is we are now in the age of incomplete information so take for example during the covid pandemic which we're still in you know scientists and doctors were developing insights day by day so understanding how to, did vitamin D help or not help? You know, when do you need a shot? How, masking, so distance, six feet distancing, all of that. We were getting information as it was being understood by experts. And that meant you had to make decisions, not with the firm clarity of looking backwards, but as events were taking place.
And that is, I think, just our reality. The speed with which information is shared means we now have to try to analyze events as they take place. We can't just wait till afterwards to get a, a neat summation. And that inherently involves trying to determine who is giving you a more thorough, more professional, more accurate uh, understanding and who's selling you something. And those are just skills that are really all of us need to develop. Uh, so I just want to summarize a little bit my position on Hoover. I think he was involved in what we would see as crimes. I think he did a lot of damage and in many ways was driven by his own personal demons, uh, this issue about purity. On the other hand, I think we America did face real, severe, and horrific enemies. And it was challenging to deal with the Soviets, to deal with the Nazis, to deal with true threats. And so I don't think in condemning Hoover, we should whitewash the threats we faced. But I do think Hoover is a real warning that when we face real threats, there is the danger that power consolidates and power needs oversight. That's what we need. We need that dialogue between the people who are in the trenches and the people who are having oversight and protecting our laws, our freedoms, our democracy. And yeah. That would be my opinion. I've spoken with friends of William Colby. And if you've ever heard that name before, you know, he's the guy that kind of blew the lid off on what the CIA's actions were doing um, during the Phoenix program. And it all came out in the Watergate hearing. I've read his testimony and I thought he did a great thing. It takes a lot of credit. But if you look at the articles that were written about him when he did that, the CIA will never recover from this. It's a bunch of stuff. And I mean, even speculation upon his death as well, too, was a little bit, I would say, weird. Um I just I look at it like I mean we got our media from one voice and when that one voice kind of came on it was mostly it was Walter Cronkite for God's sakes the amount of speculation that man did when Kennedy was shot was ridiculous um, I've listened to all that tape he's he's still alive and all this it's okay um, but I think when you start looking at like today I feel like now people would just assume their views on the basis of what they get attracted to the most because there is so much information out there's what makes it a little bit difficult to kind of step out and find out who this is now i would agree with you with your stance on hoover i think a lot of things can be rationalized I, I bet you there was a real threat i'm not like some you know person that thinks that we were only the bad guys i think that's every government i mean you explain the cold war to somebody people go oh, yeah it was when we didn't use weapons it's like you should have looked at the intelligence operations that were going on it was still a war but just a different type of war with information no government's good in my aspect of things. I go, they're doing things because they think the other person has a gun to their head doing the same exact thing. So you better have a gun to someone else's head. And that's kind of how this ends in this spectrum. And I think it's important to get that history, which leads to a question for you. When you're going into this book or you're going into writing it or just reading his in general, did you have any preconceived notions on who this man was? Because if you speak to anybody in the Kennedy community, it ain't good. I knew, I knew about, when I began my research, I did know about COINTELPRO, so I certainly knew about some elements of his crimes. So I don't think it's so much, so I, I did know that. I did not know the details, which were, um, you know, as I said, true scholars have, have exposed. Um, but my goal wasn't just to um, wave a finger and say bad man, but it was to understand uh, who was he, why did he do what he did, what was, and what does that tell us about us as a country? Because to come back to what you said and what I would again sort of say as summary, we face threats now, whether that we just were dealing with ISIS or Iran or um, Putin or China, et cetera, North Korea, we face threats. They are real. They are dangerous. They are threats to be met. Uh, 
But there is a danger that when we experience real threats, that power consolidates in those who say they're protecting us. And I think the lesson of Hoover is, yes, be vigilant, but also be vigilant against our own defenders, have both kinds of vigilance. When he died, um, right before his death or around the time of his death, I mean, did anything about him change? No, I mean, I don't think he regretted or uh anything like that uh no not not that i'm not that i'm aware of i'm afraid i am going to have yeah, to no problem um, um where can people find your links mark i appreciate the time you gave me so time. so come to mark aronson m-a-r-c-a-r-o-n-s-o-n mark aronson.com has information about a great many of my books um and uh can reach me there I'll make sure I link all your links in the description. It's been a pleasure chatting and thanks for listening to this episode. Have a blank.